Of all the types of functional groups that we've discussed so far, both in organic one and also the functional groups that we will be discussing reactions for in organic two, ethers are among the least reactive of all of those different types of functional groups. As a result, ethers are commonly used as solvents for organic reactions because a desirable characteristic of a solvent is that the solvent does not participate in the reaction itself. Instead, the solvent is just there to enable the solubilization of the different components that are desired to react with one another. One exception to that notion that ethers are not particularly reactive is that ethers do react with halo acids. And in this video, what we're going to focus on are reactions of halo of ethers with halo acids via an SN2 type reaction mechanism. In the following video, what we'll look at are reactions of ethers with halo acids by using an SN1 mechanism. And what's going to be the case when we're thinking about the mechanisms that occur here, the SN2 mechanism is going to be in place when R and R prime, and I should really say and or R prime, are at primary carbons. So that is the carbon that's directly bonded to the oxygen is a primary carbon, such as right here with diethyl ether. There's a primary carbon atom right here directly bonded to the oxygen. There's a primary carbon over here directly bonded to the oxygen. So when one of those two groups has a primary carbon directly bonded to the oxygen, that side of the molecule, that half of the molecule, is going to undergo an SN2 reaction with a halo acid. On the other hand, in the next video, we'll look at SN1 reactions, which are what will occur when the carbon that's directly bonded to the oxygen is a secondary carbon, a tertiary carbon, or something along those lines, a more sterically hindered carbon, in other words. So in this video, we're focusing exclusively on situations where the R group carbons here and here are primary carbons. So let's go ahead and take a closer look. So we'll start with an example problem here. So we'll go through the mechanism for that reaction that we saw on the title slide, where we took diethyl ether and reacted it with HBr. And specifically, I'm going to include that we have an excess of HBr. We abbreviate excess there as XS. We could also include instead there two equivalents is what would constitute an excess here. So taking a look at this reaction, first things first, Whenever you see an acid present in a reaction mixture, it is a safe assumption that the first step is going to be that the organic molecule becomes protonated, picks up a proton from the HBr. So let's go ahead and do that. So we have our diethyl ether reacting with HBr. And in this reaction, looking at our organic molecule, what can pick up a proton are going to be pi bonds and lone pairs. So here we have a lone pair available that's going to come over and pick up that proton. So our ether is acting as the base here. Our HBr is acting as the acid. That attack of the lone pair electrons on the proton forces the hydrogen bromine bond to break and the electrons in that bond to go onto the bromine. That's going to result in bromide anion as a product of this step. The other product of this step is going to be our alkyl oxonium intermediate where we have a positively charged oxygen, like so. And now at this point, what we have done is we have created within our protonated intermediate, we now have carbons that are even more electrophilic than before. So the carbons that are directly bonded to the oxygen, that is the carbon here and the carbon here, are both very electrophilic. Those carbons are very electrophilic because they are directly bonded to the strongly electron withdrawing oxygen atom here. With that positive charge, that causes that oxygen to want to pull electrons strongly toward itself and away from the rest of the molecule. So being that those carbon atoms are very electrophilic, in addition to the fact that they are not sterically hindered, 
is going to result in them being very suitable for attack by a nucleophile. And it just so happens that that first step of the reaction generated a nucleophile as well. And so what's going to happen here is that in the second step of the reaction mechanism, the nucleophile is going to attack the less sterically hindered of the two carbon atoms that are bonded to oxygen. So it's going to attack the less directly hindered CO, specifically at that very positively polarized carbon atom. And the reason it attacks the less directly hindered carbon of the two is due to the fact that this bromine bromide needs easy access to the carbon since it's attacking by an SN2 type mechanism. And so it's going to attack the less directly hindered of the two. In the case of our reaction, the two carbons here and here are totally symmetrical, and so they're equally sterically hindered, and so it doesn't matter which one of these you go for, but in the event that one of these is more sterically hindered than the other because it had a longer carbon chain or it had a branch somewhere out here further along the chain, that would create some extra steric hindrance and make the side of the molecule that has less carbon atoms in the chain or fewer branches, the side that would be attacked here. In all cases, these will be primary carbons that are directly bonded to the oxygen, but the steric hindrance ultimately can be affected by things going on later on further out the chain in the molecule. So keep that in mind if you're dealing with an asymmetrical situation. So our bromide, bromide comes in. It's going to attack the positively polarized carbon right here that forces the carbon oxygen bond to break. And that's going to give us our product of this reaction, ethyl bromide, as well as ethanol as our other product of this step. So we have effectively broken the carbon oxygen bond of the ether, and we replace that carbon oxygen bond with a carbon bromine bond. And so we can think of this as an SN2 type reaction because we have a nucleophile coming in. At the same time, the leaving group breaks away. That's the hallmark of SN2. Now, at this point in the reaction mechanism, you might think that you're done because you have achieved a point where the organic products have no formal charges and look to be relatively stable. But keep in mind, based on what we learned back in chapter 11, that alcohols react with halo acids in nucleophilic substitution reactions. And so what will happen here is due to the fact that we have an excess of HBr available, this alcohol that we have created is going to go forward and react with the second mole of the HBr. And so let's go ahead and show that process taking place. And there will be analog analogies between what we're going to show here and the first two steps of the reaction. And those analogies are that we will protonate the alcohol because the alcohol has lone pairs of electrons that are capable of picking up a proton from the acid. So since we have an excess of acid available, the oxygen atom lone pair electrons come in. They pick up a proton from the acid. So showing that, the lone pair electrons from the oxygen come over. They attack the proton. That forces the bond between the hydrogen and bromine to break, so we'll show that bond breaking right here. And then that's going to result in the creation of our protonated intermediate where we have OH2 here, still one set of lone pair electrons on the oxygen, positive formal charge on the oxygen, and then bromide anion as our other product of that step. And now much like our situation above where we've created by protonation a situation where we have a carbon oxygen bond or bonds that are very electrophilic and non-sterically hindered. We've done the same thing here by protonating this carbon atom right here on our product side of this step is going to be very electrophilic because it's directly bonded to that positively charged oxygen that's strongly electron withdrawing. And so that's going to set us up with our carbon here being very electrophilic. So therefore, in our third step of, or fourth step rather of the mechanism, what we are going to do is have the nucleophile, that's our bromide anion, attack our carbon oxygen bond, attacking that electrophilic positively polarized carbon in that process. So let's go ahead and draw out that step. 
plugging my positive charge onto the oxygen there. Bromide drawing out so that the bromide can swoop in. And that bromide will swoop in, acting as a nucleophile, attacking the carbon atom that's electrophilic, forcing the carbon oxygen bond to break. We would classify this as another SN2 type step because the nucleophile is coming in at the same time the leaving group is leaving. That's the definition of SN2. And so now we'll have a two carbon chain with a bromine group bonded to it. And so this is how in the end game for this reaction, what we end up with are alkyl halide products and the two final alkyl halide products we've created in this case are both ethyl bromide here and here. So what's happening in effect is that we are breaking the carbon oxygen bond on both sides of the ether. If we go back and look at the reactant here, we're breaking the carbon oxygen bond on the left side of the ether and the right side of the ether and replacing it on both sides, both the left side and the right side with a bromine atom to give us as a result two of these ethyl bromide products. And if we had an asymmetrical ether, the situation would be the same here in terms of we're breaking both bonds here, the CO bond here and the CO bond here. It's just you would have two different products on the product side because of the fact that the two alkyl groups here and here were different. So let's just highlight an example of that type of scenario here where we're going to look at an asymmetrical ether. And we're still focusing here on asymmetrical ethers that have two primary carbon oxygen bonds. So for our example, let's go ahead with this. And we'll react it here with HI to go forward with our reaction. And I'm going to go ahead and sketch out the mechanism for this, just as a reminder and to think about what the order of reactions would be here, since we now have an asymmetrical ether that we're working with. So just like in our first example, the first step, protonation where I'm protonating the oxygen atom of the ether, comes over, grabs the proton from HI, forcing the bond between hydrogen and iodine to break. Iodide is a great nucleophile, by the way, so that's um, one reason why we're using that as our nucleophile of choice here, or our acid of choice here. So the product of that will now be carrying a proton, an extra proton there on the oxygen. To give it a positive formal charge, plug my ethyl group in there. And then second step onward here, just like before, we saw that the second step was that the nucleophile is going to attack the electrophilic carbon that's bonded to oxygen. And if we have a choice of asymmetrical sides of the molecule, such as is the case here on the left side is not symmetrical with the right side. They're two different groups. What is going to happen is the nucleophile is going to more quickly attack the less hindered of the two. Because what is the case with SN2 reactions, such as what's going on here, is that Minimizing the steric hindrance maximizes the axis of the nucleophile of the carbon. So the less sterically hindered this carbon is right here versus here, the more favorable the attack will be. And so in the case of this example, we're going to go after the carbon that's on this side, the right side, because the right side carbon is more free and open. It is less sterically hindered than the one on the left side that has this methyl group over here and has more carbons in its chain. So drawing out my intermediate here, my alkyl oxonium, like so, getting my atoms correct in here. So we go ahead and do this, plug in that proton that was there, positive formal charge, and then our iodide 
and ion is going to preferentially attack at the less sterically hindered of those two carbon oxygen bonds. And so that's going to mean that it's coming in and attacking here on this side that forces the carbon oxygen bond to break like so, and is going to lead us to our next intermediate. So we will have ethyl iodide resulting from this reaction step. And then we will also have isobutyl alcohol as our other product of this step. So what we've done is we've had the iodine come in, attack the carbon atom here as the leaving group leaves. That's our SN2 type flow of electrons. That gives us a two carbon chain on the product side with iodine attached. And then by breaking this carbon oxygen bond, we've released a free alcohol. That alcohol is connected to our isobutyl group. And so therefore we get isobutyl alcohol. And then in the next phase of the reaction, what will happen is that due to the fact that the alcohol that we've created is subject to reaction with HI, that is exactly what will happen in the next phase of this. So we'll go ahead and protonate again. This time we're protonating the alcohol. So protonating the alcohol, draw in our isobutyl alcohol, bring in our HI. And what's going to happen is that our electron pushing arrow will take the electrons from the oxygen over to pick up a proton. Bond between hydrogen and iodine breaks, and that is going to give us our protonated intermediate here. So I have OH2. This creates water as a leaving group. That's awesome because water is a very good leaving group, creates a very stable product. We also create iodide anion, a great nucleophile here. And so then in the last but not least step of the mechanism, what we are going to do in step four here is the nucleophile, that is the iodide, is going to attack the electrophilic carbon. And the electrophilic carbon is that carbon that's directly bonded to our oxygen. So let's go ahead and draw that out to finish this up. Drawing in our alkyl oxonium like so, bring in our iodide anion, iodide anion going to attack the electrophilic carbon right here, leaving group leaves. So this is another SN2 type scenario because the nucleophile is coming in at the same time the leaving group leaves. That's going to create as our product, our isobutyl iodide as the final product of this reaction. We will also generate water has broken away as our leaving group. So this gives us our example of dealing with an asymmetrical ether where the two R groups that are bonded to the carbon, that are bonded to the oxygen rather, are not identical structures. And what's going to happen is that first the reaction targets the less sterically hindered CO. And then in the second chapter of the reaction, the more sterically hindered CO is going to be attacked and targeted for replacement with the iodine. So with that, we'll continue onward to the next video where we're going to look at this type of ether cleavage reaction. We're breaking an ether using a halo acid, focusing on situations where we'd run into an SN1 reaction mechanism instead of this SN2. So we're going to be looking at situations where the carbon that's bonded to the oxygen is sterically hindered rather than these situations we've been looking at here where the primary carbon bonded to the oxygen is not particularly sterically hindered.